All right, welcome everyone to the colloquium. Um, our speaker today is Jessica Escobel, who did her undergraduate work at St. Mary's University, uh, majoring in electrical engineering and applied physics. She did her doctoral work at Syracuse University, where she applied machine learning methods to analyze data from the micro Boone neutrino experiment. Um, since 2018, she's been at Fermilab um, as a postdoc and now as an associate scientist. Uh, she works on the muon G-2 experiment. Uh, the results of the experiment is among the most exciting developments in particle physics in recent years, and we're looking forward to hearing about these uh, developments today. Uh, Jessica is also engaged in important work in promoting equity, diversity, and inclusion in physics and in outreach. Um, she's one of the founders of Black in Physics, and has worked to improve the experiences of women, gender minorities, uh, LGBTQ+, and uh, Black physicists. As some of us know her uh, from her leadership in the Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity Alliance of the American Physical Society. Um, so welcome, Jessica. We're delighted to have you here. And the floor is yours. Awesome. I'm super, super excited to be here. Uh, wish it was in person, but you'll have me back. <laughs> Once we're unveiling run two and three um, results, which hopefully will be just as exciting. Um, so yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Um, there you go. Um, so this is gonna be the journey that we take today, the journey to the muon anomaly. Um, we'll kind of talk about what G minus two is and what the theory uh, predicts at this point in time. And then we'll dig into, you know, where Fermilab um, muon G minus two uh, fits in. And then we'll dig into the analysis, which is, I would say the bulk of the talk. Um, and then, I mean, we already know, right? What the results were. Um, and then kind of talk about um, the future, the experimental updates and, and where we're headed. <clears throat> but before we get there, let's actually kind of put all of us on the same um, slate and, and discuss what particle physics is. So um, particle physics is the study of the smallest building blocks of the universe and their fundamental interactions. And at Fermilab, we use some of the biggest detectors in the country to study these building blocks. And I like to think of our detectors sort of like a really, really, really big microscope that's peering into the unknown or the really, really tiny. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, the periodic table is actually a scientist's first attempt to catalog everything in nature, everything that's around us. Um, but once we started digging, they found out that there was more beneath the surface. And while we know of elements like hydrogen or oxygen um, and carbon, these elements are made up of something else. They aren't actually the building blocks that we as particle physicists are interested in. So what are these building blocks? <clears throat> Everything around us is made up of an assortment of protons, neutrons, electrons, and photons. Um, but there's more to the story. And fortunately for us, particle physicists, there is in fact still a lot more to learn about these sets of ingredients. So the standard model of particle physics is uh, the newest attempt at cataloging uh, the building blocks around us. Um, protons and neutrons are actually made up of things we call quarks. Um, and uh, we also have um, leptons uh, where, you know, the electron is, I guess, one of the more famous ones, but actually not the most interesting. Um, and then you also have neutrinos, which I spent, you know, five, six, eight, who knows, <laughs> years of my life um, really kind of digging at and, and studying, you know, the intricacies and the, and the exciting weirdness uh, that neutrinos have to offer. <clears throat> and I just want to point out that this is really cutting edge um, science. Um, and to kind of drill that point home, the tau neutrino uh, was actually discovered in, in 2000. Um, and as much as we have been able to discover, this actually seems to open up more questions um, than give us answers. And it's really sort of like a Pandora's box situation, but, but in a good way. 
Um, and to that point, the standard model, which is a relatively strong um, theoretical model, only actually accounts for 5% of the total matter in the universe. Um, dark matter consists of 26% and dark energy 68. So there's still a lot of questions remain like, where does gravity fit into um, this theory? Uh, what is dark energy, dark matter? Why is there this mass hierarchy that we see? Um, and then this notion of the matter, antimatter asymmetry and the reason why we're all sitting here on a Zoom call. <clears throat> so the research done at Fermilab, we can categorize into three different frontiers. The energy frontier, which focuses on direct searches of new particles. So that is like the LHC, um, the higher and higher uh, energy uh, LHC, LHC gets to, um, the more hopefully uh, rare or, or new particles we are creating. Um, then we also have the intensity frontier, which focuses on creating uh, intense neutrino beams for use in measuring neutrino properties. And I would say maybe G minus two goes in, in, this, in this frontier. Um, we create uh, intense muon beams to, to study the, the G factor, which we'll talk about. Um, and then lastly, you have the cosmic frontier, which focuses on the exploration um, of the cosmos. And I think what makes muon G minus two so unique is that it sits firmly in the middle of accelerator, nuclear, atomic, and high energy physics, which makes the experimental design and implementation really, really difficult, but also that much more amazing. <clears throat> so now let's go back to uh, the muon and how this particle could actually be the key to discovering new physics. So muons are similar to the electrons in that they have the same charge and same uh, spin, uh, they are abundant, several muons go through us every minute, and they are made from protons, um, made by protons from cosmic rays that are smashing um, atoms and molecules in the upper atmosphere. They are different to electrons uh, in the fact that they are 200 times more massive, they're unstable, they decay into uh, an electron and two neutrinos at around, I think, two, two microseconds and they uh, can penetrate material. And because they are heavier than electrons, they're more sensitive to new or exotic physics. <clears throat> um, muons also process around a magnetic field similar to this little graphic. And that precession we call uh, that the G factor. And it's related to the strength of the magnetic field that, that it's in. So the physics behind G minus two is wrapped up into a relatively simple equation here, where mu is the magnetic moment and it encodes the, the strength and, and orientation of the magnetic field. S is the spin of the particle, and then Q and M are the charge and mass of the muon, oh, in this case muon respectively. And then the G factor actually encodes the relationship between the strength of the magnetic field and how fast that particle is spinning. So back in April, when you know news of our results hit, uh, there was talk of a wobble or a wiggle um, that we were seeing uh, in these muons and how that wiggle or wobble was different than what we had um, anticipated. That is the G factor. That is um, you know, the precession in the magnetic field uh, that we see. And back in the late 20s, the G factor um, was uh, said to be spin, uh, said to be calculated as two for spin one half particles. <clears throat> so how we use this precession as a probe to beyond the standard model physics is by paying really, really, really close attention to that wobble um, and, and how a muon processes in this magnetic field. Um, and a particle in a vacuum is never actually alone. Um, a vacuum is filled with a quantum foam of virtual particles that pop in and out of existence, much like um, fizz in, in a soda. And you see those you know, little bubbles kind of pop up to the surface and, and disappear. Um, 
And the more massive a particle is, the probability of these quantum fluctuations or these virtual particles increases. And what you're seeing here on the screen is actually <clears throat> a simulation of um, you know, random uh, simulated quantum hadronic fluctuations uh, in a vacuum to really show the type of activity that we're going to be seeing in the G minus two storage ring. And <clears throat> these quantum fluctuations or these you know, virtual particles, um, they affect how the muon precesses um, around or in that ring. And that's what we're actually paying attention to is to see if the wobble changes in any sort of uh, regard different than what we have theorized or what we expect. <clears throat> so the muon magnetic moment has been the hot topic of physics conversation for close to a century. And this is really just a timeline or a rundown of the work that's done, that's been done this far. Uh, like I said, in the late 20s, Dirac calculated that G is equal to two for spin one half particles. <clears throat> and in 1948, Schwinger calculated the first correction to G. And this he viewed, and I think the physics community agreed, um, at it as you know, one of the the big breakthroughs of of the time. So much so that the the correction to G is actually on his um, tombstone. Um, and uh, between 1957 and, and 1959, the Nevis and Liverpool experiments showed that their results showed that they were consistent with the Dirac prediction and the Schwinger correction. Um, and I just kind of want to detail the differences in the experiments now as we move forward. Um, the Nevis and Liverpool experiments use stopped muons in a target, and then they rotated the spins of those muons um, by changing the magnetic field. Um, and this technique actually showed parity violation in the weak decay of the muon. And what that means is that the positron that um, decays from the muon is preferentially emitted in the direction of the spin vector of that muon. Um, and this, um, this discovery is actually what has informed the basis of every G minus two measurement since then. So now um, between 1961 and, and 1979, we have CERNs one through three. Um, and they whittled down the precision of this uh, precession frequency, um, G factor, down to 0.007%. And the, the experiment changed. Um, now, no longer are we using stopped muons in a target, but we're actually using the difference of the precession frequency of you know, the muon in the magnetic field and the cyclotron frequency of those muons going around this ring to pull out the anomalous magnetic moment. And we'll look at that, um, that math in a little bit. <clears throat> Their ring, CERNs one through three, were made up of separate magnets. And because of this, it caused a variation in the magnetic field that meant that the G minus two frequency of the muons going around the ring were dependent on where they were around the ring. So it added an additional layer of uncertainty because of that. So moving on to BNL, they take the torch um, and they move from instead of a pion injection, a muon injection. So that that move reduces uncertainty. Um, and they also moved from many different magnets to only one magnet. Um, and this reduces the uncertainty of the dependency of the muons around the ring. They also added an electromagnetic kicker, which is a finicky beast, but very, very important. And then lastly, they also mapped the magnetic field around the ring um, to really get a precise measurement of that magnetic field. And the, those differences created a 14 time improvement um, from CERN to BNL. And now Fermilab has taken the torch. 
<clears throat> so here are um, the Feynman diagram breakdowns of various quantum fluctuations to the muon G minus two factor. Um, and this vertical wiggly line here is actually um, the magnetic field. And this first diagram here is um, the magnetic moment when G is equal to two. And then the next three diagrams depict the quantum fluctuation effect resulting from the first one is the electrodynamic contributions, the electroweak contributions, or the hadronic contributions. And you can see kind of like in the middle of the V where the um, quantum fluctuations happen. And this uh, Feynman diagram right here is the Schwinger's correction to the quantum electrodynamic um, anomaly. And then you also have the electroweak contributions going on in this diagram. And then lastly, the hadronic contributions. So you see, you know, pions um, coming into play. <clears throat> so adding up all of these contributions, you get the equation for the muon anomalous magnetic moment, which equals to G minus two over two. Hence the reason why muon G minus two is called mu on g minus two. It's literally the equation that we're trying to, to solve. So this looks relatively simple, right? Like it, it isn't, it, it gets more difficult and, and we'll get into it in a little bit. Um, but as experimentalists, we're honing in on ways to measure a more precise um, muon anomalous magnetic moment. Our theory friends were dedicating their time on calculating a more precise standard model equivalent. And this was a large undertaking from over 132 author authors, 82 institutions, and 21 countries. And their most recent um, results were published in 2020. And here you can see the value and the uncertainty of each contribution with the hadronic contributions having the largest uncertainty. Um, here you see, uh, HVP stands for hydronic vacuum polarization, and HLBL is the hydronic light by light. Um, and the reason for this uh, higher uncertainty in the hydronic <clears throat> contribution is due to the fact that the hydronic structure is governed by the strong interaction, and this is difficult to calculate directly as we can't use a perturbation theory. Um, and that's what we use to calculate QED or the electroweak contributions uh, due to the dependency of the virtual photon momentum. And the way this is calculated um, to get these values and these uncertainties is by integrating over all of the possible virtual photon momentum. And the current HVP uncertainty is at 0.6% with a 0.37 ppm, which you see there. And then the HLBL is at 20% with a 0 0.15 um, ppm parts per million precision. So um, the, the numbers that you saw previously, these are calculated using the data-driven approach. Um, and the theory initiative uses inputs from all of these different experiments to, to calculate those values and uncertainties. Um, so it's, it's a very robust um, way of calculating you know, the standard model prediction. And even though we have difficulties in calculating these hadronic uh, contributions to the muon anomalous um, moment, the theory community has been able to reduce uncertainty significantly over the past 20 years. And this is, you know, what you're seeing here is between around 2004 till now, they've been able to reduce the uncertainty significantly. And the tension between experiment and theory has remained. Um, and right now we're at a 3.7 sigma uncertainty, which isn't enough to um, say, you know, a discovery um, has been made, but it, it hasn't been going away. <clears throat> so the story, however, is actually more complicated than that. There are multiple ways to calculate these hadronic corrections. The first, like I said, it is using the experimental uh, data together with dispersion. The second, however, is using direct calculations of Euclidean lattice QCD. 
Um, and at this moment in time, the uncertainties on this second strategy are still larger than the data-driven approach um, at 2% for HVP and 45% for the HLBL. And right now, in proving these calculations um, for the hadronic um, you know, contributions is a top priority for our theory friends. Um, and there is, you can see it stands out pretty clearly, right? Um, this BMW 20 data point on this, on this plot um, has smaller uncertainties compared to the other um, direct Euclidean uh, calculations for these hadronic contributions. And that is due to uh, the fact that they don't, they're not statistically limited. Um, and the theory community is very excited to see uh, these calculations for the BMW 20 um, group at different energy regi regimes so that they can have, so, so that the, the calculation can be uh, vetted and compared to the dispersion slash data cal calculations. Um, but either way, this discrepancy that we're seeing between the two calculations could also potentially be new physics that we aren't aware of. Um, but for this talk, I'm going to be using the recommended value from the theory initiative, which is the black data point down here, WP20, um, that is um, what experiments are, are using to compare to theory at this, at this point in time. <clears throat> so there's this tension between uh, theory and experiment, right? But then there's also a tension between the, you know, within the theory community as well. And out of all of the press that came out back in April, this is one of my favorite quotes. And it states, but for the moment, the past 20 years of conflict between theory and experiment appear to have been replaced by something even more unexpected, a battle of theory versus theory. So it's a really, really exciting time to be, uh, you know, a, a physicist on, on G minus two, because there's still a lot of questions that we're, we're trying to answer. <clears throat> so now let's go into, you know, uh, what we're doing here at Fermilab. So the muon G minus two collaboration consists of seven countries, 33 institutions, and about 203 members. Uh, what happened to my plot? Okay, let me see if I can refresh it. Sorry, guys, give me a minute. Uh, okay. Can we see that? Okay, perfect. Sorry about that. There's, there's always a so it's technical difficulties. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, the main limit um, with the BNL experiment was due to statistics. So the need for a more intense beam um, was, you know, we needed a, a more intense beam. And Fermilab has the capability of reducing this, that statistical uncertainty from 460 part per million, which is what BNL had, to about 100 part per million. And the first part of the G minus two experiment is getting the muons to our storage ring. So the beam starts with an eight, with eight GeV protons. <clears throat> and then the recycler ring, which you see here, splits, um, the batches into four bunches um, and each bunch has 16 fills. And this happens every 1.4 uh, seconds. So after it's been split, uh, the next step is to collide each of, that, each of the bunches with a nickel alloy fixed target. And you can see it uh, right here. And this collision results in uh, 3.1 GeV pions that are then selected and focused using a pulse magnet and lithium lens. And you can see <clears throat> right here on the right, um, the pion distribution of the beam before selection and then after selection. And the reason why we have it, um, well, one, why it's really, really uh, narrow uh, distribution and why we have it centered around uh, three GeV over C is due to the fact that um, this is what we call a magic momentum 
um, and it, it reduces the complexity of the, 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 the calculation for the anomalous magnetic uh, moment. So this idea of a magic momentum really just simplifies um, simplifies the, the, the equation. <laughs> Sorry about that. <clears throat> the next step is uh, then that the pions decay in flight along the 279 uh, meter transfer line and 80% of these pions decay and 95 and, and creates a 95% polarized uh, beam. And then from there, um, and now you can see the, the animation, these bunches then circulate the delivery ring four times um, to remove any of the protons and that we just missed it, it'll go again. <laughs> any of the proton contamination that's still there. And we get a, a pure, um muon beam that's injected into the storage ring the muon g minus two storage ring at about 3.1 gev over c and right now it's supposedly in the storage ring <clears throat> so i'll let that play one more time so you see it being broken up into four bunches it going into the delivery ring to remove any proton contamination and then it gets injected into our storage ring okay now let's talk about that storage ring. The storage ring is a $25 million magnet. Um, it's actually the same ring that BNL used. Um, and the ring is an extensively sensitive device. It can't be bent or twisted by more than a few millimeters or it renders it useless. It's a hunk of metal. Um, so it was a, a very stressful time in um, G minus two collaborators' lives, uh, moving it from New York to Illinois. Um, and you can kind of see in the background, you know, the route that it took, um, most of it was by barge. And there were four accelerometers and one tilt meter on that barge. And when the water got too choppy, a feed went to a satellite modem that would auto dial an engineer the engineer in charge day or night, and they would make the decision to park it or to keep going. So it was a really, you know, um, complicated uh, path that that the the ring took. And then we had to reassemble. So I'm just gonna play this while I take a drink, um, and it's you know, you'll see. <laughs> So yeah, the building that um, you see the ring coming into, this is MC1. This is where um, the muon G minus two uh, experiment is stationed here at Fermilab. Um, and this is really just kind of, you know, one of those quick montages of, of the amount of, of work, um, oops, sorry, that went into putting this ring back together. Let me speed it up a little bit. So now you're seeing, the, the pole pieces go in. And we're gonna talk about all of the pieces that just go into this ring in a little bit. Um, yep, and there, now it's put together. Okay, so now let's break it down. So the storage ring is a 50 foot diameter magnet. Um, it has a 1.45 Tesla magnetic field, and it was imperative to get this magnetic field as uniform as possible around the ring. So after it was put together, the next year was in um, making sure that magnetic field uh, was uniform. <clears throat> so this is um, a kind of a cross section of, of that ring. And once the, the magnet was assembled, the process of what we call shimming began. And I didn't, I didn't know what that meant, but essentially shimming is the technical term for 
placing a little piece of cardboard or paper underneath a wobbly desk. We did that at a much higher precision all the way around the ring. <laughs> um, so the first kind of lever that we had is called uh, the top hat. And um, stepping back, the ring actually has, is made up of 12 uh, C-shaped yokes, these guys right here. Um, and they have uh, six poles per yoke. And those are the big kind of metal things that we saw in the video that we were putting in. Um, and there's three upper and three lower poles per yoke. And these top hats actually adjust the whole yoke um, by you know 30 degrees, so this way. Um, and we have 48 of these top hat levers. The next thing we have are shims or pieces of metal that were added above and below the pole to minimize any boundary discontinuities. So essentially what we with the shims did was make sure that there were no discontinuities between the poles in like the up and down um, or you know vertical uh, direction. The next thing we had were wedges that moved uh, in and out for adjustments on a 10 degree section. Um, so now, while uh, the, the shims helped it vertically, these wedges now moved it in the horizontal direction to remove those boundary discontinuities. And then we had these laminations, 8,400 laminations, and you can see they look like pieces of foil paper. <laughs> Um, each one of these laminations were simulated uh, with a com you know, computer simulation and um, all of the shimming positions, and you can kind of see them here on the, on the poles uh, and the thickness of these laminations were, were calculated. And then lastly, we have more of um, an active shimming and we call these the surface coils. And they're composed of two sets of 100 current carrying coils with varying radial dependence to minimize any of the higher order gradients and traverse components of the magnetic field. And you can see here before the um, surface coil shimming occurred, you have these higher order uh, gradients in the magnetic field. And then after the surface coil shimming, you see much of them is reduced. So this is one of my favorite um, simulations. What you're seeing is the whole year of shimming happening and the, the change in the magnetic field across the ring. And the blue line is the BNLs um, mapping of the magnetic field. And you can see that after this process of shimming, um, Fermilab was able to get a threefold improvement on the overall magnetic field uniformity um, compared to BNL. <clears throat> so now let's get the muons into the ring. Uh, so right here, you can see that we have the 3.1 GeV muons coming from um, the, the accelerator complex. Um, specifically the delivery ring. And the first thing that it hits is called the inflector. And what the inflector does is injects the muons into the ring and deflects the magnetic field that the ring has. So the inflector actually has an equal but opposite magnetic field so that when the muons go into the channel, which you can kind of see here, they're not deflected out of the ring, but they're able to be stored into the ring. The next thing um, that the, the, mu the muon beam hits are called the electrostatic quads. And these are used for vertical focusing and they cover 43% of the ring. So you have, like you can see two here and then two up here. Um, and what I mean by vertical focusing is that they don't kind of spiral out or spiral down um, out of the ring. Um, and one of the issues that we had to contend with in run one was that we had two damaged resistors um, and that meant that some of the quads didn't stabilize um, before our, our fit time and made the vertical muon um, distribution of our beam shift down by about 0 0.6 millimeters. So that was something that we had to correct for on the back end. Um, this, these damaged resistors were fixed by run two, but like I said, it added another systematic that we had to address. <clears throat> um, so one of the things that I contributed to the run one of results was actually implementing um, this 
uh, effect into our end-to-end -end simulation so that we could actually pull out that systematic. Um, yeah, and then lastly, one of the things uh, that the quads also do is actually scrape um, off the kind of edge cases of our muons so that we reduce the amount of muon loss that happens as the muons go around the ring because that is another systematic that we need to contend with. Next is the kicker. And I've already said <laughs> the kickers um, have a special place in my heart. Um, doing grad work on Microboon, I, it was fully software. Um, and then, you know, before I went into grad school, I was a software development analyst uh, for, for the Air Force. So my wheelhouse was software. And as a newly minted postdoc on Yuan G minus two, my first task was to help completely overhaul the kicker system because it needed a, a huge upgrade. And like, for that reason, you know, I'm team kicker. <laughs> um, but that experience of literally touching every aspect of the kicker subsystem really gave me insight uh, to help in the development of more robust monitoring systems for the kicker in upgrading our end-to-end -end simulation to account for the real world kicks that the muons were seeing. Um, and it also gave me insight into how to uh, help mitigate the high voltage limitations uh, that we were seeing in, in run one. The kick wasn't strong enough to get the muons into that magic momentum that I uh, discussed uh, in you know a couple of slides previously, um, which reduces kind of the electric field used uh, for the quads. <clears throat> um, so that was something that we had to uh, fix within um, the kicker. And uh, one of the other things that we had to kind of deal with was the fact that our beam wasn't monoenergetic. And we saw that right um, when we were discussing uh, how we create this muon beam is that it's a distribution around that magic momentum. Um, so depending on where a specific muon is in that distribution, it's gonna feel a different kick. And then on top of that, if you look down here at the bottom, our kick is in a delta function. We have a bit of ringing that uh, occurs that the, the muons are going to feel, and that's going to affect you know, the muon distribution in our beam. Um, and that's due to the fact that we have these curved kicker plates um, rather than, than flat or straight. <clears throat> Okay, so the next thing that we see um, are calorimeters. And we have um, 24 calorimeters around the ring and they're made up of a, a array of nine by six lead fluoride crystals. And as muons go around the ring, the spin vector rotates around its momentum vector. And after about a hundred turns, the muon then decays via the weak interaction producing a positron. And the positron is what actually the calorimeters uh, see. And the calorimeters measure the energy and the time of arrival. So each one of these cal calorimeters also needs to be calibrated uh, to precisely understand the response of said positron um, with a specific energy per crystal per calorimeter. Um, so on top of that, we also have a laser calibration system and that's used to quantify uh, the systematic of the response difference per uh, crystal. Um, and this calibration happens around every three days. So I'm giving you a lot, right? But I really want you know, um, you all have to have kind of like a, a broader understanding and sense of all of the systematics um, that we as a, as a collaboration had to think of and quantify to get to um, the anomalous magnetic moment. <clears throat> so this is a graphic of the oscillation that we would see as a function of the spin vector around the momentum vector um, in our calorimeters. And I just want to point out that in, in reality, the oscillation that you see before this threshold energy isn't as pronounced. And that's essentially why we chose the threshold energy to be uh, where it's at. <clears throat> uh, and this is the actual oscillation from positron energy um, due to that parity violation of the muon decay 
um, we can actually correlate the positron energy that we're seeing in the calorimeters to the muon um, uh, rotating around, the, sorry, the spin vector of the muon rotating around the momentum vector. And one thing I do want to point out is that as it goes along in time, you're also seeing this exponential decay happen to that oscillation. And that's due to the fact that where, um, as the muons are going around the ring, they're also decaying, and that reduces the amount of muons that are, you know, circling around the ring. <clears throat> Last component. <laughs> So now we have the trackers and the trackers are located about 180 and uh, 270 degrees um, at the ring right here. And they measure the trajectory of those decay positrons. And the uh, trackers are composed of straws, which you can see here, and they have a 15 micron wall thickness um, and they have a 125 millimeter hit resolution and a sub millimeter resolution on, on beam location. And the reason we have these trackers is to actually get a, an idea of how the beam moves and breathes um, as it's going around the ring. Like I said, we don't have a point beam, right? We don't have a laser or a monoenergetic beam. Um, so we get this oscillation, not only horizontally, um, but vertically. And this breathing, these, this movement we call coherent betatron oscillation. And just like you saw um, the, the wiggle, right, of the muons going around the ring and the, the spin vector going around the momentum vector have that oscillation of this CBO, this coherent betatron oscillation, is very similar, right? So the reason we have the trackers is that so that we could quantify this and, and pull this out from the actual omega A, from the actual wiggle that we're interested in. <clears throat> so now let's go into the analysis and what is in you know, a wiggle plot. So the cycloton frequency you see here is the you know, the frequency that the muons are going around um, the ring. And then you also have the spin precession frequency, which encodes that, that G factor. So these are the two equations of, of importance and they're relatively simple, right? <clears throat> Where omega A comes in, and we talked about this in CERNs one through three, is actually the difference between these frequencies, between the spin precession frequency and the cyclotron frequency. And when, these, um, when this difference is zero, omega A is zero. And what that means is that the momentum vector and the spin vector are aligned all the way around the ring. There's no precession occurring, right? <clears throat> oh, sorry, playing again. Next. There you go. Okay, but when they don't equal zero, you get this equation where omega A is equal to G minus two over two times uh, the charge of uh, the muon and the magnetic field over the mass um, and the constant C. And this G minus two over two, we are already familiar with it. It's that anomalous magnetic uh, moment of, of the muon. So when this occurs, when omega A is not zero, you then start seeing that precession of the spin vector around that muon vector. And that's what we're measuring. <clears throat> and this is, I think, I'm, I think it's just a change of variable. Yeah, perfect. So what we measure on G minus two is that omega A, that wiggle, and also, the, the magnetic field. And these are the two things that we focus all of our time on getting a really, really precise measurement for. <clears throat> so doing you know, a change of variable, omega A over omega P tilde, and we'll talk about that, what that is. Um, this, this is the ratio, that's, what, that's, that's our measurement. And these um, variables right here, these ratios, are actually measured by other experiments to a precision of less than 22 part per billion. So really, really precise. <clears throat> uh, this omega P tilde 
is what we call the proton Larmor precession frequency. And we use a spherical water sample uh, to, to get a precise measurement of the magnetic field. And we'll go into detail on that. Um, yeah, and I talk, talked about that. So, I mean, it looks relatively easy, right? <laughs> two, two measurements, take the ratio of them. Um, but in reality, it, it's way more complicated uh, than that. Um, so these two um, terms actually expand out to a lot, a lot more things that we have to um, kind of step through. And that's, that's what we're going to do. We're going to step through them now. <clears throat> so this F clock is what we call the blind, unblinding factor. And we'll talk about that a little later. We have omega A, which is the muon precession frequency. And then we have these beam dynamic corrections. And these corrections are due to the fact that the beam is a living, breathing organism. It's not a point particle. It's not monoenergetic. It moves as it's being stored in the muon in an oscillating fashion that's very, very similar to the muon precession. And that's why we need to correct for that. Um, then we also have a magnetic field that is also weighted um, by the beam, by the movement of um, uh, the muon beam. And then also we have transient field corrections that are due to the fact that we have quads that are doing this vertical, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Vertical focusing and the kicker that's kicking things into the right uh, orbit. So there's a lot of corrections that, that, that occur. And all of these corrections and systematic uncertainty calculations led to four journal articles, um, one dedicated to the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, and the other three are detailing the beam dynamic corrections, the omega A corrections, and the magnetic measurement and, and corrections um, in that as well. So there's, there was a lot of work. <laughs> so let's step through the variables. Um, we've already seen this, this graphic of the spin um, oscillating around the momentum vector. <clears throat> so this is actually real data that you're seeing of that wiggle uh, omega a um, happening in, in the, cali the calorimeters along the ring. <clears throat> And we've already seen this graphic, so I'm going to step through. Um, and this is the wiggle, right? From the calorimeters, from the positron time of arrival and energy, um, we pull this out of the um, calorimeters and we fit this. <clears throat> and then from the fit, we get a residuals and we do a Fourier transfer on them and see you know, the coherent betatron oscillations that are occurring due to that movement of um, the beam. And that's what we have to correct for. And to do that, we use the tracker information um, and the oscillation that we see um, the beam doing in the vertical and the horizontal direction. And we use this to enhance our fit. And um, that takes it from a five parameter fit to a 22 parameter fit. And now you see that you know, those uh, peaks in the Fourier transform are, are reduced and we have a really good fit. So this is actually done using three different techniques and 11 different and independent analyses. On top of that, we have a software unblinding frequency for each one of these analyses. And those frequencies, those unblinding frequencies are actually different from our run 1A, which we unblinded in uh, 2019. So you can see you know, um, that the first kind of sanity check is to check that all of these different techniques and analyses are aligning um, with each other. Uh, and then we do the unblinding. <clears throat> and you see that the depend it's not uh, dependent on the different analyses or the, the technique uh, that is being used. Um, so that was the first stage um, of unblinding that we did for the omega A measurement. And then here you just see the different uh, types of systematic uncertainties 
that we accounted for and calculated and the total uncertainty for just omega A. Next, we have um, the E field and pitch corrections. And I think we're running short on time. So I'm gonna go through these uh, relatively quickly, but essentially uh, we pulled out a fit for the E field the, and pitch corrections um, that are due to um, the, the, the beam, the way it moves um, and use that to correct for uh, omega A. And then we also had to correct for um, any phase acceptance um, and muon loss due to uh, the beam. And this we can discuss <laughs> in, um, in the Q&A session. Um, yeah, I, I wanna make sure to leave time for that. Um, yeah, um, and this is uh, in the, the phase acceptance specifically, um, this is due to damaged resistors. Um, and you see that there's an early to late effect um, that the beam is seen because of those resistors. Um, and I think you can see it here uh, most uh, clearly. And this is something that we had to correct for as well. And um, this specific correction isn't something that we're going to have to do in runs to on. Um, this is specifically because of the, those damaged resistors that we had to contend with. So after all of that, you can see the correction terms as well as the uncertainties on those corrections. And now let's move on to the denominator. <clears throat> so uh, the first step in uh, calculating the magnetic field is actually calibrating um, the, the measurement tools that we're using. And this is what kind of what you're seeing here. Um, we have a proton sample uh, that we use a magnetic field to align um, the spins of the protons. Um, and then we put that sample into an RF coil, which tips the magnetization of that sample. And then we let it go through free induction decay um, and fit uh, this oscillation um, to extract a frequency. And then this is then used to calculate the, the magnetic field. Uh, okay. We also have um, th these NMR probes that we just calibrated, uh, 17 of them in this trolley, which is a, a little car. And um, we use this to measure the magnetic field inside the storage ring. And this happens every three days. Um, so that trolley goes around the ring, all the way around the ring and measures the magnetic field cross sections around the ring. And then we use these cross sections to get a magnetic field distribution. So this is actually what the muons are seeing. And then, um, actually, let me go back. In between the three day measurements, we also have those same NMR probes on the exterior around the ring that's measuring uh, the magnetic field. So there is an extrapolation uh, that is occurring between um, the measurements that are taking inside the ring and the measurements of the magnetic field that are constantly being taken as we are uh, doing data collection. So we know the magnetic field pretty much very, very precisely all the time. <clears throat> and then we have these quad and kicker transient corrections. And this was discovered at when I started on G minus two and it blew my mind. <laughs> so essentially what this is showing is that when we pulse the quads on, um, that act of pulsing them vibrates the plates ever so slightly that it creates a transient uh, field that we need to contend with, that we need to calculate and pull a systematic out. Um, so this is what you're seeing. When the quad is not being pulsed, you see it, um, the field change at zero parts per billion. And then when we pulse the quads, you see this oscillation that's occurring um, that, we need to, that we needed to understand and, and quantify. This to me shows how precise 
is precise when I'm talking about a precise, a precision experiment. Um, they're everything we had to think of. <clears throat> and then lastly, the same type of kicker transients um, due to the pulsing of the kickers, uh, we also had to, to quantify. And we used a, a magnetometer um, here. Uh, we can go into detail on that as well. So now quantifying the denominator, you see the correction terms as well as the uncertainties for that. And I mean, that should be it, right? No, there was still a lot more <laughs> systematics that, that were done. And this just kind of shows a running table of all the systematics as uh, uh, calculations as well as their uncertainties. And this uh, encompasses pile up, gain change, the skin depth effect of measuring the magnetic field through you know, the actual magnet. Um, and this is what took years um, to lock down. <clears throat> So this is the total uh, uh, table of the correction terms and, and the uncertainty. Um, and our goal um, is to get to uh, 100 parts per billion. Uh, and comparing that to BNL, the uncertainty they saw or measured was 540 parts per billion. And then comparing to the standard model, um, the standard model uncertainty is at 360 parts per billion. So there's still work to be done to be able to compare experiment to theory, and that's what we're working on. Um, our goal is to get 20 times the amount of statistics that BNL has. Um, yep. Yeah. So at at the end of the day, we want to be doing four times better um, than the current theory calculation, which is 360 ppb. So now let's go to the results. I mean, we all know it, but the last thing that we had to do was actually unblind um, ourselves from so, so that we could actually see what the, the measurement was. So there's a 10 megahertz GPS clock that measures both the omega A and the omega P frequencies. And there was a hardware blinded frequency, and this is this is something different than than I think other experiments um, have done with regards to blinding themselves from the data, adding an actual hardware blinded frequency um, that only two non collaboration members and they're pictured here knew um, uh, what it was and they're the ones that set set that clock. And the uncertainty on that clock system is actually two parts per billion. So, so even the GPS clock that we use to get the blinding um, factor that we put onto our data, we detailed, we calculated the uncertainty to you. Um, anyways, on February 25th, all of us were on a Zoom call with about 170 collaborators and we voted unanimously to unblind. And it was a really, um, anxiety inducing, uh, I think, uh, experience. There was a person that had a, a Python script. They were sharing their screen. They inputted the, the blinding frequency and we got you know, the, the, the number out. Um, and Fermilab G-2 confirmed 20 years later, the BNL experimental results and the tension between the standard model and the experiment grew from 3.7 uh, sigma to 4.2. Um, so the green point right here is the recommended standard model um, point uh, from the theory initiative. And this is our new experimental average. And just so we understand what 4.2 sigma means, that essentially means that the chance that this is a statistical fluctuation um, that a statistical fluctuation would produce this uh, is about one in 40,000. So we're, we're, we're close, but, but not quite there. And like I said, the theory community is also contending with um, where this, this standard model prediction point should, should lay. So at this point in time, both the theory and the experiment are, you know, wobbling. So it's going to be really interesting to see where, in fact, we land. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, okay, so this is actually where we're at right now. It's it's a bit it's a bit old. Um, so you know we just saw our run one results, and that's only six percent of the full statistics that we aim to collect. And um, right now we have a four hundred and thirty four PPP. PPB statistical uncertainty and a 157 parts per billion systematic uncertainty. Runs two and three are in the can. And actually we just finished um, going through uh, the reconstruction of, of this data and are starting to analyze. Um, and this is a twofold reduction in the total uncertainty. And right now the systematics are on track to be less than 100 parts per billion. And we have, I think this past summer, finished our run four analysis and actually have just started to uh, go through a data uh, reconstruction of, of this set. Um, so we plan, I, I think our, our aim is within a year or so to publish runs two and three um, results together. So it, sh it should be a very exciting time. Um, and then the just lastly, um, I can't cover all of the upgrades that we've done from um, since run one on. So I'm gonna focus on what I contributed to, which was mainly the kicker overhaul. Um, so essentially we uh, got more voltage, we reduced the sparking and you can kind of see right here that we were we were getting a lot of sparking that was happening in the kickers, so much so that we were um, burning out the, the wires um, that the high voltage was running through. Um, you can see this is our capacitor bank that I had to uh, overhaul. Again, a whole bunch of sparking that was happening. And this is the feed through. So um, the feed through is what connects our kind of kicker subsystem inside the ring to the plates that are inside the ring. And you see the sparking was so significant that that pitting was occurring in, in that feed through. So all of this was upgraded. We have a whole new kind of uh, resistor, what we call a bazooka to hold the increase in charge. Um, and then on top of that, there was a lot of uh, work with regards to um, the hall cooling. So um, we implemented a whole new uh, cooling system in the actual building due to the fact that the differences in the temperature, the ambient temperature actually affects the magnetic field um, uh, precision in the ring. So by kind of leveling out the, the cooling uh, or the variation in the, in the temperature, uh, we were also able to reduce the systematic of, of temperature on the magnetic field. Um, and then lastly, we had an improved field mapping, um, you know, uh, upgrades in the, in the trolley, upgrades in the NMR probes that we used. And then all of the upgrades that we did hardware-wise, we also had to implement in our end-to-end -end simulation um, so that uh, any sort of systematics that we're pulling from simulation align with what's actually going on um, and, the, and the upgrades that we did in the hall. Uh, so a lot of work has been happening um, from two on. Yeah, and, and that's it. I hope I didn't go too far over. No, 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 only five minutes. That's pretty, that's yeah. pretty impressive. <laughs> well, we, are, we also started late. Great, thank you. That was, that was a great overview of the experiment. And uh, uh, I, I guess we should turn over for questions now, um, especially from students, but uh, open to everyone really. Just raise your hand or, and I'll call on you. All right. Uh, go ahead, Don. So uh, the the equipment. Uh, my question has to do with the the equipment that was moved from Brookhaven to to Fermi Lab. Mm -hmm. um, what are the chances that that piece of equipment has some systematic error, and that's why those two experiments gave the same result for sigma different than uh, than the theory? Yeah. No. That's a that's a really good question. Um, and so the field mapping. Um, 
just just like I detailed the the difference in calculating omega a. Um, there are different analyses and different methods of also calculating that magnetic field. Uh, some of them are similar to the ones that BNL use, but also uh, strikingly different than the ones uh, that BNL use. On top of that, uh, the kicker subsystem is completely different. The quad uh, system also had a, a huge uh, upgrade. So there's um, not only are we seeing uh, significant changes in the hardware portion of the experiment. We also have different analyses um, that, that were taking place on the software end as well. And also, um, I'm not as familiar with it, but uh, there is a systematic uh, um, that was calculated to account for potential overlap due to the fact that we have the same ring. Thank you. For the next question, um, I guess, Sophia, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you would share what your favorite part like of working on this was or what you found the most interesting about your work on this experiment. Mm, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I knew what a precision experiment actually meant until I was on the experiment and we're talking about like, the tiniest kind of uh, oscillation or, or, or movement from the, the quad plates. Um, I, I think that that is when I realized how, how significant, um, significantly precise we had to get to actually probe, um, you know, the quantum fluctuations at the like hadronic level. Um, so I would say just kind of wrapping my head around this is this is really I, it's it's impressive it's impressive that we are able to get to such a high precision I would say thank you great uh, so Walter do you want to go next uh, yes thank you for the nice talk and for taking us in detail through all these experimental details but I have a a theory in question, and, and that is, um, if there is like a deviation from the standard model for the muon on the G factor, does that mean we also have to expect that there is also a deviation for the electron? Mm. Or do the, I mean, do I mean I know of course the calculation will be done in quantum electrodynamics for the deviation of the G factor. Right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Do these. Um, hadronic and weak things play a smaller role in the electron because it has a smaller mass or how does that work? Oh, you're really testing my knowledge. <laughs> um, so I, I would definitely say that um, the, 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 the tension comes more from the uh, electro weak and the hadronic contributions or the kind of quantum fluctuations in, in that regime and not so much in the electrodynamic um, space. Uh, so from my understanding, I, I do not think that we should uh, expect um, a different a, a tension between the, the theoretical and the experimental um, G factor of, of the electron, but but I'm not sure if if there's a theorist in the in the crowd, please correct me. I've sat through so many theory talks, but it's still like. <laughs> well, I have, to, I have to say that the theorists are, are, are very confused on this issue. But yeah. the next question is, in fact, from a theorist, Pavel. So I'll let him answer. Well, I, I just wanted or to make, ask his question. I mean, yeah. I just wanted to make a comment and also reply to Walter. You know, uh, Walter, uh, the scales, when you compute the, the G minus two photo for the electron, the scales are very different. <laughs> and plus is, um, you know, of course, a QED correlation is similar. The weak correlation will, uh, can be actually different. And, and since the scale is different, where you make the calculation, the adronic part, the, the contribution is actually, is a different scale. Even everything that she analyzed uh, using lattice calculation to do the, the full calculation of the drawing, this depends a lot of the skill where you are making the calculation. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the results are actually different. 
Plus, if you if you really uh, think about the fact that let, let's assume that they really found the large deviation from the standard model and it's only in the mu. It's actually it's very simple to have new physics model where you only affect the G minus two factor and you don't touch any any other. Because uh, it's something that we, we understand as a flavor symmetry. So, you know, every family can have different interactions due to the fact that you could have some different flavor symmetries and different families will uh, feel different interactions. Therefore, you can actually have a large deviation for G minus two for the mu, and you don't, not necessarily have to touch the rest of the people. We don't really know that part very well because this is quite, we don't really know what is an emphasis. Huh? Um, so the electron case theory and experiment agree very well, right? As far as I know. Uh, uh, yes, I, it's pretty good. Uh, and, and as I said, the, uh, the scales are very different. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there is a, a more than two order of magnitude. Therefore, this is actually, uh, uh, you know, one of the issues, let's say. But it's easy to imagine a very simple model where you only touch the G minus two. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, for the mu, and then you don't have to, you don't make any mess for the rest. That's it. Um, this is one thing I just, regarding the talk, thank you for the talk. Uh, I, I just was uh, wondering, you know, uh, I, I am happy that you mentioned the BMW result for the calculation of the only elements. You know, the, the truth is that I don't know how many years will take even if you improve and improve and you, you say you have 20 times more data, it's still from the theory point of view, it's so hard because you know lattice calculation is something that is no, it's something, you know, it's just approximation to do calculations mm -hmm. uh, in QCD in the strong regime that no, no, it's, it's not even well proved for everything. Therefore, I would say, the, to, to really make any conclusion, probably we will have to waste so much time to be able to, to say there is some disagreement. Therefore, I, I know that having a nice propaganda plot for Fermilab to say 4.2 sigma is nice, but the, the truth is that the, you should put something more that they show you that probably there is only two sigma if you believe experts in Europe doing the BMW calculation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because the other method is actually semi it's not really a very it's it, it, they do the best but uh, it's just some extrapolation to be able to estimate the drone contribution therefore i don't know it's amazing that the experiment they uh, you know is doing so well but maybe we have to wait so much to to reach any uh, strong conclusion yeah no i agree and i think that's why i said that Looking at that plot, both of those, you know, data points, the theory and the experiment, th they're wiggling, right? Because both the theory community and the experiment community are working really, really hard to reduce uh, uncertainties on 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 our measurement. Um, so, but you, you know, the, the we're waiting on bated breath to see what comes out of the theory community the as thing well. About measuring something uh, that depends of uh, new uh, adroni thing is uh, it's very hard to say something. Yeah, yeah. I, I should say later the time. I, I think we'll carry on and have informal discussion. But maybe I'll just let uh, Bob ask a last question and then we'll uh, end the formal proceedings. Go ahead, Bob. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, Bob, you're muted. So I was trying to turn my video on. Um, so this is, oh my gosh, Jessica, it was such a terrific command of this whole complicated system and history and everything. It was really impressive. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to know when we were talking about ambient temperature, who, uh, forgive me, the temperature of what? Oh, the literal temperature in the hall. So one of, one of the things that we saw in run one was that when the temperature, I think we started in winter. Right, um, and and then as the temperatures rose, we started seeing deviations or variations in our magnetic field uh, around the ring. Um, so to mitigate that for run one, um, we put little little blanket <laughs> over our ring uh, to try and kind of um, reduce the the variations that it was feeling. And then once we went into shutdown um, mode, we uh, beefed up. The temperature in in the hall so that the 
the ambient temperature that was happening outside wouldn't affect the temperature that we were feeling inside of um, the, the building where a little magnet was in. Well, it's not little, it's huge. <laughs> Very good, great. I, I suppose that you didn't, you wouldn't want to have a lot of people go walking around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, when we're in data taking mode, um, the hall is closed. Like it, it's shut down. Um, and the only times that we go in is when we're we're not receiving beam um, or and even at that, we have a whole bunch of like processes that we need to uh, uh, make sure we're accounting for for safety because the the ring is still on it's a relative it's a it's a strong magnetic field um so that's the only times that we can come in or when the 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 ring is off when the magnetic field is off thank you very much mm -hmm. that is really such a great story i mean such a high-tech experiment but then you were telling us about the shimming and now you're telling us you covered it with a blanket yeah, that's I, really <laughs> I love yeah, that. yeah. Um, we get it done right. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we should end the formal proceedings here. So we're going to try. Uh, let's let's thank our speaker and another Zoom warm, uh, Zoom applause is a little bit lukewarm, but it was a really fantastic talk. So we should try to show our appreciation. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, now I invite everyone to.